magma that spews forth from places like White Island reminds us that catastrophe is never far away. The poisonous gas, a caustic cue to the Armageddon that surely awaits us. But despite the ever-present threat of doom in all its forms, when catastrophe strikes New Zealand, it never fails to shock. The eruption of Mount Ruapehu provided us with a visual symphony of shocking images that sent ski boarders packing like little girls. The very first meeting of Maori and Pākehā also ended in an explosive volcano of violence. It was just off this point west of Nelson that Abel Tasman lay anchor. Local Maori immediately dispatched a waka to meet the visitors but this was to be no waterborne pofery. What transpired was an altercation of shocking ferocity that caught Tasman's men completely by surprise. <laughs> it was possibly a bad move for the Dutchman to wave knives at the Maori, who failed to see the gesture as a call for a sort of free trade agreement. The event was dramatised in a radio play in the 1940s. Penetrate. Ah, Ruth, come in. I was just preparing my Dutch oven. Captain, I'm afraid I have some bad news. Yes? Some of the men have been clubbed to death by the New Zealand natives. Oh, I do wish you'd be more careful with the natives, Rude. Yes, sorry. Oh, well, never mind. Here, have some of this... Tasman recorded the event in his captain's log. Remarkably, the murderous encounter was also captured by the ship's animator in a series of sketches. Using specially developed digital technology and with help from Weta Workshop, we've been able to bring these images to life in this computer-generated animation, seen here for the first time. The bashing of the hapless Dutchman is strangely mesmerizing. Sadly, the Dutch would later suffer a similar fate at the hands of the Nazis. Surprisingly, New Zealand has its own Nazi history. Here on the borders of Remuera and Eden is home for Colin King Ansell. Believe it or not, this was the epicenter of the Nazi party in New Zealand. A family man, this printer and barman is leader of New Zealand's Nazis. He's pinned the swastika firmly onto the electorate's map and started campaigning. Party propaganda is on the way to electors. We use Mein Kampf as a, as a very basic guide. Um, you couldn't use the full Mein Kampf. But, um, King Ansel may have looked like Jim Anderton, but his immigration policies were possibly a little more like those of Winston Peters. White is right, according to Mr King Ansel. Polynesians have no place in our society. We would institute a repatriation of the Polynesians back to their island homelands. Why have they got to go? Because they were here before we were. I'm um, referring, you're referring to the Maoris, of course. Um, the Maoris will be allowed to stay here. They're New Zealanders, as far as the party's concerned. It's the Polynesians. Uh, we differentiate between Polynesian and Maori. A Polynesian is an islander or person from overseas. Despite his progressive policies, King Ansel failed to capture the hearts and minds of the Remuera electorate, possibly due to his poor desktop publishing skills. In 1972, you only received 35 votes. How are you going to fight this campaign? Um, I learned a lot from the last elections. Um, I learned where I made my mistakes. I didn't go out and try and meet the people. Um, a lot of my uh, material was very, very poorly printed because I didn't have any commercial out out that, you know, no commercial part of my own, now to get everything printed. I didn't know enough about layout, artwork and things of that nature, and of course, um, a lot of it suffered. But King Ansel wasn't our first Nazi. That honour belongs to another man. His name was Roy Nicholas Kurlander, Auckland Battalion 1939, Waffen SS 1942. Proof of Kurlander's Nazi past lies in war records supplied to homes from Berlin. 
Corlander went to the war as a New Zealand soldier, where he was captured before defecting and re-emerging as an SS officer. The Nazis used him for broadcasting anti-Jewish propaganda, much like British Nazi William Joyce, alias Lord Haw Haw. Hello England. The uh, Germans are frightfully nice people and the, the trains are awfully punctual and the streets are paved in gold. Oh, my teeth, are they? Tally-ho! So, why did the young New Zealander join Hitler's SS? They were loaded with drink. Um, they were provided with, with high-class women to look after their needs. And they had, they had a glorious time. Corlander was sentenced to nine years at Mount Eden for aiding the enemy, but was released after only three. He disappeared to Australia in the 1960s, but not before he became a fixture at Auckland's various sex spots. Club owner and king of striptease, Rainton Hasty remembers the Kiwi Nazi very well. He used to sort of uh, tell us that uh, he was in the German SS during the war. Of course, uh, none of us believed him. We thought he was sort of big noting around the town and uh, uh, nobody really took any notice. But as we are about to find out, that would all change. Science is constantly asking questions of our natural history, and new discoveries about our past can provide some of our most shocking revelations. Archaeologists have found remains of a new species of human. They were tiny people covered in hair. Recently discovered evidence suggests these Hirsute Homo sapiens may have settled here well before Maori, and even before Moriori. Ancient burial grounds have been unearthed near Karori and Wellington. Their contents could yet rewrite the history of New Zealand. This inauspicious site, just kilometres from the capital, may well be the last resting place of a people anthropologists are calling the Karori Moriori, or the Karoriori. By studying a 1,400-year-old skull, scientists have been able to reconstruct this image of the Karoriori. They were a diminutive people, barely three feet tall, with long arms and prominent foreheads. Their brains would have been much smaller than even Tony Veach's. This exact copy of the skull gives you a sense of how incredibly small this human was, with a brain far tinier than scientists have thought possible for any human being. Scientists believe the Karoriori were an agile hunter-gatherer people. Their modern ancestors include jockeys, sports people and broadcasters. Sadly, the last full-blooded Karoriori was killed at this gallery in Wanganui in 1912, when a caretaker mistook him for an opossum. The River City has long been irrigated with scandal. Vice, filth and moral decay are regarded as popular recreational pastimes here. But despite its proud history of depravity, what began here in the Sergeant Art Gallery was too much even for Wanganui. In 1920, Wanganui's Mayor Charles Mackey invited a shiftless gay poet called Darcy Cresswell to admire this vaguely homoerotic artwork. It was a gentlemanly come on from the queer mayor. One thing led to another and Cresswell threatened to out the mayor as a homosexual. In desperation, Mackey shot but failed to kill Cresswell and served a seven-year prison sentence for his troubles. Embarrassed city officials had Mackey's name removed from the street. They renamed it Jellico. Mackey later fled to Europe where he was mistaken for a communist in Berlin and shot to death by a policeman. 
As for Cresswell, he gassed himself. It could have all been very different if only they'd stopped to admire this Edith Collier painting of a healthy young woman. Like Mackie, British cricket legend Jeff Boycott caused a sexual shock in New Zealand, but this was a hetero shocker that some considered a googly. The Daily Mirror claimed Boycott's bust up with a quote, pretty TV girl, happened after he allegedly made comments about her. Look, I made some compliments to the girl. She's got lovely smiles, she's got great legs. I said to her in Northern humour, good Yorkshire humour, I said I'd sooner spend a week with you than a night. But Boycott's silly mid-off didn't shock New Zealand as much as an unorthodox local body election in Wellington. In 1977, our most celebrated transsexual, Carmen, ran for mayor. Well, it all depends on some people. As for me, I'm a terribly sexy lady. Even more shocking, the campaign was the brainchild of a man called Bob Jones. I used to write these speeches, Alish. <laughs> Carmen would say the most insulting things to the other candidates. And of course, she couldn't read them. Well, he call it what you will, because she simply couldn't pronounce the words. The current programs of soliciting donations is producing pledges and commitments. I can remember putting an enormous amount of effort trying to bring these down to single syllable words and this sort of thing. And Carmen would lean over and always wearing this great low neck, neck low, with these enormous bloody breasts that she'd managed to achieve through whatever you do, chemicals and whatnot, and often they'd pop out. <laughs> and the audience would be elated, and Carmen they would straighten up and carry on struggling with each word. A few days before the um, election, we ran a full-page ad in the Dom, Citizens for Carmen. <laughs> and, and we had quite a few of them, including your boss, Ian Fraser, who were genuine, Brian Edwards and that. But, you know, in time was of the essence, so I banged a few other buggers in as well without bothering to ask them first, and they were very prominent citizens without no putting any old name in there. Well, the libel which were the lawyer's letters flowing into iron hell. It was terribly funny. Early indications on election night had Carmen well in the lead. The results seemed to indicate that she would win the mayoralty by a landslide. Suddenly there was a delay of results for about half an hour, and suddenly Carmen's coming last everywhere. Now, I just find that implausible. There were 16, if I recall rightly, councils. Carmen comes 17th? Oh, come on. You know, I think they rigged it. I really do. I'd like to thank my hairdresser, my uh, dressmaker who's here. Bob Jones and Carmen may seem like an unlikely double act. Oh, sorry, Chris. Thanks. But the relationship between Pakia and Maori wasn't always so convivial. I didn't know what to say, love. Is that enough? In fact, the arrival of the white man was quite a shock for the Tangata Whenua, as illustrated in this recently restored animated film from the 1940s. In 1981, a groundbreaking stage production put a new spin on New Zealand's most shocking peacetime disaster. Pull up, pull up! Where is that mountain in front of behind us? It's so hard to tell with this cursed snow blindness. Surely the plane's autopilot takes care of us. Let's hope it knows how to dodge a Mount Erebus. Mount Erebus.
Erebus the Musical is widely considered to be the most shockingly misguided piece of theatre to ever be attempted in New Zealand, and ran for only five performances. It's just an orchestrated litany of lies, of lies, of lies, of lies. While Erebus the Musical is clearly the low point for theatre, television has its own hall of shame. For the next five and three quarter hours, Melody Rules. <laughs> Melody Rules is widely regarded as one of the most shocking misfires in New Zealand television history. It was a sitcom made by committee and American experts, a sure recipe for a shocking disaster. But Melody Rules has been unfairly singled out, for we have a proud history of ill-fated programs. From the curse of the gold lame suit that ripped McCormick to the professional foul that was the misguided footy show. Predictably, the program involved racism toward Asians. Hello, welcome back to the Lion Red footy show. And Germans. I know nothing. I see nothing. I know nothing. Nothing. But the most trouble came from this segment that involved inappropriate touching. As a male or female, there are bigger cars than Dowling. The two footballers groped at poor Emily Drum, captain of the New Zealand ladies cricket team known as the White Bats, but try as they might, they couldn't guess who she was. Like a car accident in slow motion, it was hard to turn one's head from the carnage. But it was the beginning of the end for the show, which was soon cancelled, never to return. It's hard to know what Coupe would have made of the footy show, or of burly men hovering over a young woman and touching her up for ratings. The footy show got off lightly compared to some. One man with wandering hands was destined to pay a hefty price for his unsolicited advances in an incident involving eight dungaree-clad women and an oak tree. This is the very tree in Auckland's Albert Park that was the scene of something so shocking that it would soil the pants of grown men. One night in 1984, playwright Mervyn Thompson was abducted, dragged here and tied up by women unfairly described by some as rampant lesbian separatist bitches. I mean, I feared that I might be castrated. And, and I seriously thought, now this may be my imagination, I don't want to overstate it, but I seriously uh, um, considered what life might be like um, as a castrato. Thompson was a university lecturer. Everyone knew he liked the ladies. He had wandering hands and footsie feet. But he blundered right into the middle of a sexual revolution and was wrongly accused of rape. Um, I'm supposed to be a womanizer. Um, I believe that I'm the shadow of a former womanizer. I've certainly not raped anybody. Thompson and the woman who hogtied him were strange bedfellows in the hotbed of 1980s sexual politics. Their audacious attack on the academic was more than just a piece of mm. pussy whipping, mm. it was a vaginal jihad. Shut up! Like Thompson, Skippy the Bush Kangaroo was also wrongly accused of rape during a promotional tour of the South Island. But nothing prepared us for the shocking truth about our first truly A-list celebrity animal. Like the myths surrounding the Moriori, the true story of Shrek has only recently been revealed. At first we thought that Shrek had been lost in the hills for years, but new evidence has emerged. This secret footage shows the sheep being secretly moved from the laboratory where he was secretly created some seven days before he was supposedly discovered in the hills. The story was so good, it fooled news organizations all over the world. A household name, a top celebrity in central Otago, making it the world's most mammoth, Miracle Marino. Bob Labia, CMBCC3. 
Trek was the result of a botched experiment here at the Omaru Institute of Agricultural Genetics, home of the famous carrot phone. But regardless of his origins, Shrek became a national celebrity and a TV star in Japan. でも一つ分かったことは羊っていうのは毛を刈らないで野生でいいあれ。の主人公に似ているという理由でシュレック君って言ったの。まあ、女の子もあまり情報が少なかったんですよ。Whether it be Maui shocket fishing up fried frame or the simple shock of a Somali family moving in next door. There's little doubt that shock has always been a part of life in New Zealand. Our Aotearoa land of shock. This show was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.